Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hope for Animals Summit. This is a very special bonus a webinar that we've put together as a gift to all of you for attending this summit. We're so glad you could join us. So my name is Lisa Levinson. I'm the Sustainable Activism Campaign Director for In Defense of Animals, and I have the pleasure of introducing my co-host, Joan Ranquit, who is going to be doing our uh, bonus webinar today. So the webinar will be on the forgotten power of animal communication and its rightful place in the animal advocacy movement with Joan Ranquit. So Joan is an animal communicator, speaker, and founder of Communication with All Life University and author of Energy Healing for Animals, a hands-on guide for enhancing the health, longevity, and happiness of your pets and Communication with All Life, Revelations of an Animal Communicator. Joan is also a contributor in the upcoming book out in June of 2017, The Dharma of Dogs by Tammy Simon. Joan conducts private sessions and teaches animal communication in teleseminars and weekend workshops. She speaks all over the country on animal communication, human-animal relationships, energy healing, and wildlife. She has been featured in dozens of media outlets, including Pet Nation on Dateline NBC, The Today Show on NBC, Good Morning America on ABC, Animal Planet, The National Enquirer, Los Angeles Times, The Sun Sentinel, and Palm Beach Post. She was the celebrity animal communicator in a short documentary on the AMC channel. Joan lives with her large animal family of horses, dogs, and cats. You can learn more about Joan at joanranquet.com. So it's my pleasure to turn over this webinar to Joan. Well, thank you. And it's been such a great pleasure to work with you and to host this, uh, co-host this summit with you and Lisa. And I want to thank you for all the work you do and in defense of animals. And I also want to thank all the people that have been joining us all along and uh, thank all the people that will get to see this. And I want to thank Sally for manning the chat box. Um, so anyway, I am going to jump over to sharing my screen and I know that you will um, let me know if I'm not there. And I'm here, right? Do you see it? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So um, I want to start my little talk, which is the forgotten power of animal communication and its rightful place in animal advocacy. So um, I've been an animal communicator for about 25 years. And in that time, I've gotten to write a couple of books, one called Communication with All Life, and it's out with uh, Hay House, and Energy Healing for Animals. Um, and it's published by Sounds True. And one of the most important things that I think about animal communication um, is that, you know, we're really healing relationships. We're really um, people that, have, that are out there, my students, myself, we're really working with people and animals. And one of the biggest things when we uh, communicate with someone is, is we're... Um, enhancing or empowering a relationship to develop. And I think when we get out of relationship with animals or the planet is when we, as a, as a human race, uh, get into big trouble. And we're really teetering on that now. Um, and so I have a big program for people to become animal communicators called Communication with All Life University. And I started that in about 09. I've been teaching since 1998. And I love to, um, to get people out there learning animal communication as best they can. And animal communication. Animal communication is um, in the form that I'm doing it when I get on the phone with somebody's animal or, um, you know, I do it on the phone a lot. Got ahead of myself there. Uh, so telepathy, when you're communicating with an animal, I mean, obviously we can communicate. We, we pick up on their, their subtle meows or their loud meows or their big barks or their body language. 
But ultimately, communication is telepathy, the transference of pictures, words, and feelings. And we all do this. We've been doing animal communication since the beginning of time. When we were born, we were doing it with our caregivers, our mothers, our fathers, anyone that was around us. And we eventually learned language. And as we learned language, our need for and our ability to do telepathy started diminishing. So everybody is picking up on feelings from their animals. I often say that people go to the chiropractor for their husband's bad back. Um, you know, we pick up on the energy around us physically, mentally, and emotionally. And often people see pictures from their animals and they don't realize it. They just think it's their own thought. Um, they might hear words from their animals. And certainly everybody's pretty aware, and especially anybody that's in this summit, you're probably very empathic and you really pick up on the feelings of the animals in your household. So these are really important things, tools, skills. I think of animal communication not as a gift, but as a skill. And it's uh, relearning a muscle, being able to decipher and trust yourself with the pictures, words, and feelings from animals. And we all do this. I'm not special. Um, I'm just really disciplined and um, worked really hard. And um, and so that's what I teach. And as an animal communicator, as I said a little bit earlier, that it's it's all about relationship, right? An animal communicator is out there honoring the human-animal relationship and being a conduit for transforming the relationship when necessary. So. That's what we do with our domestic animals. And why is it so important? It's all about honoring these relationships. And the other thing that's just absolutely amazing with a lot of the people that we've had speaking in the summit is that science is really starting to recognize sentience. Um, and what, when I say that, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, Time Magazine can have on the cover this border collie that knows, you know, 102 words or, um, you know, just there's a lot more recognition of uh, the love hormone that is released in people and animals. And in the past, the love hormone was thought only to be, you know, released in people in a romantic relationship. Well, it turns out just, you know, people's heart rate lowers from a purring cat or a petting a dog. And the heart is, I mean, the, the purr is actually known to heal heart disease and bone density. So we would only know that, that a purring cat can heal heart disease and bone density and increase bone density if science had, has gotten involved. So, you know, the good news is science is really starting to recognize sentience and that is huge. So I feel like, it's, I feel like that's what we achieved in this summit and what we can carry on past this summit is that we're really bringing together the people that are on all sides of it that are, are working toward harmony with animals. So we can all be part of a big shift here on planet Earth as we become more aware of animal communication. And um, the shift here on planet Earth is really super important um, because we can't survive if our apex predators are going. We can't survive. And you know what? I don't want to survive if we don't have our beautiful animals here on the planet. And when we think about this planet Earth and the wildlife, it's a really small percentage anymore of this Earth that has wildlife roaming free in the way that we like to think of wildlife. And that's something that a lot of people don't even realize. So when I think about animal communication, I think that my personal mission is to empower others to deeply collect, connect with all life so that together, we can give voice to those who can't speak for themselves. Together, we can improve the adventure here on planet Earth for all species, and we can raise the frequency of everyone and everything while we're at it. So that is always, that's my perfect world. And unfortunately, we aren't living in that perfect world yet. Um, and I have four things that really, really get to me in the middle of the night if I let it. Um, unfortunately, I've got a lot of tools to move through that. Well, I'll be sharing one of those tools here um, after my presentation, which is a, a really powerful tool. Um, so the four things that just get me enraged are, um, number one is the genocide in the shelters, because I think of how many animals get um, 
placed there and then get euthanized. And we as a society do very little in our throwaway society to take responsibility for those relationships. Um, the, the other thing, number two, is the rapid extinction of wildlife and, and what we are doing to the planet. I mean, if we think of the planet as a living organism, how we're treating the planet is not, you know, goes hand in hand with the rapid extinction of wildlife. Um, factory farming is something that sends me over the edge. I can't even, I can't even fathom it. And um, exploitation in the name of science or entertainment. Um, it's just, that's just beyond anything I can comprehend. And of course, after doing the summit, I would add to this, um, and I, it had been in my awareness, but seeing Mark Chang speak was just really powerful. And so I would say that a lot of, you know, the, the Chinese and the, the Asian meat trade is really just beyond disturbing for me. And, for, you know, when I boil this down, if I were to boil this down, you know, if you look at the genocide in the shelters, the rapid extinction of the wildlife, the factory farming, the exploitation of animals in the name of science or entertainment, and the, the meat trade, we are taking an animal who has a relationship with someone else, whether it's a human or um, their animal family, and taking them out of that, often euthanizing them, or if it's you know in the name of entertainment, we're still splitting up families that are um, for our purpose. And again, going back to the relationship, that is something that I, I just, I can't even, just doesn't even translate in my mind how we can be doing that. You know, whether it's my, you know, family cat got used for somebody's dinner. It's just beyond anything I can comprehend. And so I really, you know, this is one of those things, I've, in a funny way, I've always looked for how could I, what could I make this whole planet and, and history? How could I bring this all together for myself? I've always kind of looked for that thing. And so I started thinking before the summit about uh, animals, what our relationship with animals has been historically. And it really kind of put the entire planet and the history of the world in perspective for me. And so I thought I'd share some of it uh, with you. So how did we come to this way of living where some animals sleep in our bed and others are used for food, scientific research, exploited for entertainment and more? How did we get here? And so I thought I would take a look around at what thought forms, religious based ideas and cultural biases that existed before modern science did. It was those ideas that gave permission to further the exploit of animals. And so I want to walk through the, some of these, these, this whole. Um, so, in if we look at Africa, the beginning of the, you know, the world as we know it, um, and humans and what have you, people's daily need, daily needs have always been associated with natural phenomena. So they look around and it was, you know, it was magical. Oh my God, the thunder is coming. That means that we'll have rain. But you know all these sorts of things that it, it all was a mystery and magical. So therefore nature and the environment are infused in traditional African customs and religion. Traditional wor worship occurs outdoors. Uh, most indigenous cultures in Africa believe in God and the supernatural. They are able to believe in animism, that spirits enliven nature and the animals. In many African cultures, animals held signs and symbols for humans. Uh, these signs and symbols could be used in rituals. The sighting of a certain animal may foretell or have significance for an event in the future. And there is a deep reverence and a connection to the natural world and animals. So there is relationship. Our cultures viewed animals as equals in terms of rights. While they did hunt, it was strictly for food. There was a connection made with the spirit of the animal and hunting took place on perceived permission. There was a reverence for the animal and the land. Land was not owned, nor were animals. There were certain competitive moments um, and not all Native American tribes were complete angels. I mean, certainly they were territorial and had their stuff and that may involve an animal. Um, however, as a whole, they could have been seen as practicing animism um, the, the belief that animals, plants, the planet have spirits. 
And that kept a very strong and deep connection to the animals and the planet. It was a relationship. Uh, there were rituals and ceremonies around hunting and planting. There was a deep reverence. In South America, uh, in Mesoamerican cultures of Central America and reaching down to South America, the pre-Columbian era, some Mesoamerican cultures, Olmec, Aztecs, Mayan, and Incas, did own livestock, and I might add that they also did in, in Africa. And, um, and there, there may have been, they were more of a hunter-gatherer based um, group of people and had a deep reverence for the land and animals. For example, Mayan public ritual focused on agriculture was performed regularly. They held rituals that involved theatrical impersonation of situations, and some of the ritual was represented by animals. Uh, they had hunting rituals. They preserved the bones and skulls of animals and restored them to their supernatural owners for regeneration. So that was, I mean, even how they hunted had, again, a certain reverence and respect and relationship. Um, hunting taboos were about wounding the game. Um, they believed that the Mayans had soul companions. Uh, the Mayans believed that they had soul companions, often animals, also called coessences. And animal persons have a place among the Mayans in a role as a healer, artist, but they could also be seen as deities. Uh, animal persons have been possibly humans in former lives. Culture around animals was much more ritualistic with regard to the hunt and their sustenance. Um, they were superstitious about the idea of ever harming to harm. So again, they had huge relationship with the planet and animals. And in Asia, while Islam is a Muslim religion, is the largest religion in Asia today, um, and we'll go into that in a minute, along with Christianity and Judaism. That the those three were not the friendliest cultures to animals, but the other religions that um, were originally from Asia, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Shinto, they share the concepts of Dharma, Karma, and reincarnation. And transmigration, the reincarnation in and out of human animal bodies um, experiences is a shared belief among some of those religions. Um, animism would also be a big part of that. Um, Again, the belief that, that everything spirit has a spirit, um, that plants and animals and the planet itself is enlivened. Um, and ancient art of this region suggests that animals were livestock guarded by pack animals. There was hunting and horses were ridden into battle. Um, horses also, this is where the relationship, um, working, real working relationship and relationship started with horses. Um, a lot of these cultures revered their animals, their horses so much that they actually slept in the tents. And I know one of my horses would cheerfully sleep in my bedroom with us. Um, so there, while there was, you know, some good and bad there, it just was what it was. Um, so horses were very much um, also seen as power animals and uh, their, their power was seen as magnificent um, and they were very revered. Uh, and the images of a lot of the art uh, also invoked divinity and an awe of the natural world. There was also a practicality for things uh, like animals like the yak. Um, you know, they were, yaks were definitely started to be, you know, were used here. Working relationships were developed and um, animals were seen as fertility of the land. Um, animals as imagery also expressed authority. Again, going back to the horse, like this magnificence. Um, metaphors of the animal world were used in ritual. Unfortunately, much of the animal byproducts, i.e. ivory, at that point also became symbols of wealth and prestige. Um, and to this day, animal byproducts, organs, and glands are used in Chinese medicine. In Australia, the first people of Australia were nomadic people that came from Southern Asia. While they were hunters, they were very aware of the fragile nature of the earth. Um, the British called these first people Aborigines. Aborigines uh, believe that animal, plant, and human ancestors created the world and everything in it. They called this dream time. 
and you can die and come back as a plant or an animal um, or human. The Aborigines did not believe they owned the land. They see an interconnected an interconnectedness of all of all, the environment is not a separate entity from an individual or human or animal. Um, and this interconnectedness brings on a sense of moral obligation. They were very respectful of the natural life cycles and careful not to overfish or overhunt. They are, there are celebrations and rituals involved in hunting and there is relationship and respect. Um, Aborigines don't believe if, um, uh, they don't believe in the need for artificial uh, management of wildlife. They, they find that offensive to the animals and animals manage themselves. Animals are very present in their legend, history and ceremonies and art. And again, it just truly invokes the concept of relationship with earth and animal. Antarctica um, don't have a large history of relationship with animals in the earth because nobody could live there. Um, and so humans haven't screwed this up. Uh, Antarctica was part of a greater landmass and way before humans showed up in Africa. So it was uninhabited by humans until less than 200 years ago. Now there are about 40,000 annually that visit every summer and a thousand maybe in the winter. Um, and most of those are scientists, uh, but many animals have been living there for a long, long time. And I'm sure that all those animals are animistic in their worldview. So that's um, that's the the ongoing religion or cultural bias of that center historically. And then we really had some challenges with regard to our ideas. I mean, they didn't see it as a challenge, but now it's we are challenged with what this thought form brought about. So if we look at um, Aristotle, um, he really presented a hierarchical relationship um, with humans at the top. And the logic was that humans are rational. And this is the beginning of what is known as speciesism. Um, and then the Judeo-Christian Muslim faiths, um, they considered, they believed they had dominion over animals. and they're very anthropocentric, which is believing that humans are the center of the universe, um, and speciesist, which is uh, the practice of favoring one species over another, mainly humans over all else, which ultimately leads to the mistreatment and exploitation of all animals. And this is, I, I believe this period of time, this concept is really what blossomed into what we have now. Um, biblical references repeatedly talk about our dominion over the animals. And rather than being carried out as caretaking, it ended up being seen as being superior and to some degree, um, well, not in some degree, really, there's a lot of slavery. Really, it, it comes down to slavery. Um, they were property, not individual beings with their own souls, karma, or purpose. And much of the ethics of animal welfare at that time was centered around if something happened to the property, the animal. So if your dog got hurt, it wouldn't be that this individual dog was hurt. It was that I'd pay you back for the amount of money that your dog was worth. Um, so this is how we started valuing animals as property. Um, and if we were to believe that we were superior, we can justify and eating animals easily effort and effortlessly. And we can also have no problem torturing them in the name of mascara. So, you know, this concept led to, um, you know, this whole, we're rational and they aren't, so we can do what we do to them. Um, so science has certainly tortured animals for a long time um, and they don't even classify certain animals um, as, as animals, so they can justify their, their experimentation. And they forget there is a soul in there and that there's a potential for a soul connection and a relationship. And again, I mean, there's certain, I think that they, they declassified rats as rats so that they can continue to do the experimentation. I, and it's, um, I think when we aren't seeing something as a whole because of our logic, we get into a lot of trouble. And so, 
Um, on the flip side of that, we're starting to see religion to come to come around because now we have this idea that the Pope has presented, which is something that as empaths we've all known and felt. And I know I got in a lot of trouble in the first grade with Sister Pimenti because she told me there were no animals didn't have souls. And I fought her to the end. And I think I uncatholiced myself at that point in the first grade. Um, so the Pope has recently said, one day we will see our animals again in the eternity of Christ. Paradise is open to all God's creatures. He said this when a little boy was grieving the loss of his dog. So we're starting to see um, we're, we're starting to see that um, again, a lot of the scientists or biologists, scientists that were in this summit are, are believers in sentience. And um, we've got religion starting to recognize it, um, you know, of the three big Christianity, Muslims, and the and Jewish faith. I mean, we're starting to see it really coming together in its minute form. And it's, um, I think that as uh, as empaths, as activists, we have to bring our um, our love of animals to to the table here and meet you know meet religion and science and we're really the trailblazers in this and animal communication is a very important thing because if we don't put the fact that we have relationships with them that they have relationships with each other and that they have huge feelings and that our torture or our um, taking them away from their family is going to bring on grief. If we aren't really um, bringing that into the forefront, um, people are just going to carry on because it's just been this old thought form. So we really are revolutionary in how we're um, fighting this big, big thought form because it's, um, while many cultures have seen it all along, somehow this idea of dominion over the animals has become a very uh, the dominating thought that has carried on culturally. So we have we have some work to do, and I want to um, really um, bring up. I want to do some uh, technique that I teach called EFT, emotional freedom technique, and uh, because I know that when we're on the forefront with this whole concept, that we are again, fighting a big idea. We might even be having arguments in our own family. So um, we've got to, in order to stay strong, we've got to do a lot of self-care. And I thought that I would teach you, and um, this will be very experiential. You can follow me with this technique called EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique. So what we're going to do is, yes, here. That's a great idea, Joan. Can you turn your slides off and then we'll yes. um, invite Sally to join us? Okay. Am I here? Yes, you are. Are my slides off? Okay, goody. All mm -hmm. right. Um, Sally. Hello. Hello. Okay. So um, what uh, what we're going to do is... Uh, emotional freedom technique, and I'm going to put my little notes right there, and hopefully I can see them. Yes. Um, what we're going to do is uh, do some tapping. And so emotional freedom technique, or EFT tapping, is a um, type of body work uh, and energy work combined where we're going to tap on the meridians, uh, tap on specific uh acupressure points. And why this is important is each of these acupressure points have an, a, um, a connection to the meridians and the connections and the meridians have a connection to the organs and the organs have a connection to our emotional life. So each of these are even physically going to stop, um, start to mitigate some of the overwhelming emotions. And they're also going to, um, the story that we're going to tell is going to kind of do a big release also. And this technique, by the way, is something you can do 
um, with your dogs and cats and horses for other challenges and birds. Um, it's a technique that I teach and um, has been very successful with behavioral challenges, but let's just, um, and, and the emotions that come with it for the humans. So right now we're going to do a round of tapping on our overwhelm and also um, not just our overwhelm, but how we feel as people that are trying to help and trying to be, I mean, we have no choice. We came onto the planet this lifetime in this giant empathic role. And for many of us, this is our complete mission, right? My mission is to connect up so that people recognize relationship and that everybody's able to deeply connect. And your mission may be very, very equally powerful, just a little different than mine. But at some point, we are all speaking on behalf of the animals and that can be very overwhelming. So um, what happens when we tap is we do a setup statement and then we move through the meridians. And what I'm going to do is have Sally ready to go. Um, and as I tap, she's going to echo. She's going to, she's going to repeat after me, which is what you're going to do at home when you're watching this. So um, she's going to follow me. And um, are you ready, Sally? I am. Okay. So um, let's get started. So first we're going to do the karate chop point and then we're gonna move through the points, but you'll just follow me physically and repeat after me. So let's go. Even though I get completely overwhelmed when I think I'm the voice of the animals. Even though I get completely overwhelmed when I think I'm the voice of the animals. And I feel like I have so much work to do. And I feel like I have so much work to do. And I can't get to all of it. And I can't get to all of it. And I love and accept myself. I love and accept myself. Even though this is so overwhelming. Even though this is so overwhelming. And I don't think I'm ever going to get through it all. And I don't think I'm ever going to get through it all. I can't even stop my family from eating meat. I can't even stop my family from eating meat. How do I think I'm going to have an impact in the world? How do I think I'm going to have an impact in the world? And I love and accept myself. I love and accept myself. Even though this is so hard. Even though this is so hard. The entire planet has a different worldview about animals than I do. The entire planet has a different worldview about animals than I do. I can't even walk in the grocery store. I can't even walk in the grocery store. And I am trying really hard to help. And I am trying really hard to help. And I honor the choices I'm making. And I honor the choices I'm making. Tapping through the points. I feel like I can't do anything. I feel like I can't do anything. I am not making an impact. I am not making an impact. I feel very alone in this. I feel very alone in this. When I think about things like the Chinese meat trade, I feel so helpless. When I think about things like the Chinese meat trade, I feel so helpless. When I think about factory farming, I feel so helpless. When I think about factory farming, I feel so helpless. When I, feel, when I think about so many things out there, I feel really helpless. When I think about so many things out there, I feel really helpless. I feel like, oh my God, I am so too late. I feel like, oh my God, I am so too late. I'm too late for those animals in the shelter. I'm too late for those animals in the shelter. And I feel like there's nothing I can do. And I feel like there's nothing I can do. So I shut down. So I shut down. I shut my voice down. I shut my voice down. I can't even look on the internet. I can't even look on the internet. Facebook becomes like rescue porn. 
Facebook becomes like rescue porn. And I am very overwhelmed. And I am very overwhelmed. I am so overwhelmed. I am so overwhelmed. I am so overwhelmed. I am so overwhelmed. My throat closes. My throat closes. I shut down. I shut down. I feel sick to my stomach. I feel sick to my stomach. I have no way of fixing this. I have no way of fixing this. I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to start. I really don't know where to start. I really don't know where to start. I have tried everything. I have tried everything. I've told so many people. I've told so many people. They're really sick of hearing me. They're really sick of hearing me. And so I get very isolated. And so I get very isolated. I am really sick of being isolated. I am really sick of being isolated. I know I am powerful. I know I am powerful. I am going to go ahead and pull my bootstraps up. I am going to go ahead and pull my bootstraps up. And even if I'm alone. And even if I'm alone. I'm going to start moving forward. I'm going to start moving forward. I'm going to be their voice. I'm going to be their voice. I'm going to help it be heard in the land. I'm going to help it be heard in the land. That animals have big feelings. Animals have big feelings. And big families. And big families. And that their relationships are important. And their relationships are important. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to be empowered. I'm going to be empowered. And I'm going to empower others. And I'm going to empower others. And I'm going to remember that there are help outlets. And I'm going to remember that there are help outlets. There are call centers. There are call centers. There are other people that share my view. There are other people that share my view. There are other people that share enough of my view. There are other people that share enough of my view. That we can get out there and make a difference. That we can get out there and make a difference. It doesn't do me any good to shut down. It doesn't do me any good to shut down. So those days are over. Those days are over. I am here for a reason. I am here for a reason. And I am here to share that reason. And I am here to share that reason. I'm not helping anybody by being silent. I'm not helping anybody by being silent. So I'm going to let my freak flag fly. So I'm going to let my freak flag fly. I am out there. I am out there. Spreading the news. Spreading the news. Sharing the love. Sharing the love. The love that the animals have. The love that the animals have. And I'm going to listen to other people. And I'm going to listen to other people. And I'm going to share the animal story. And I'm going to share the animal story. And I want you to take a deep breath. <sighs> All right, Sally, did that shake anything free? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Okay. There's that feeling of helplessness, isn't it? Or are they overwhelmed? Exactly what you were saying. So, um, yeah. And for those that are new to tapping, even just tapping these points, just tapping, just tapping when you're really overwhelmed can start to release some of it. So, um, we have a lot of work to do, so we have to have tools that will help us um, stay in there and keep the good word out there. And uh, my cat, Buster Keaton, agrees. He's sleeping right next to me. So um, anyway, I want to thank you and thank you for uh, joining and watching the webinar. And I hope that this has helped. And please keep 
staying out there talking to the animals and reminding people about their relationships. And thank you, Joan, so very much for teaching us this special tool. I was tapping along with you. Oh, <laughs> and good. Yes, and you mentioned some resources, and we do have resources for animal activists. Um, for From In Defense of Animals, we have an activist support line. So for anyone who does feel overwhelmed um, or helpless, you're welcome to call. We have free counseling, and the number is one 800 705 and we also have an activist support group that we offer online every month and a lot of other webinars and tools that we have ongoing. So you're welcome to check those out at uh, idausa.org slash events. We're here for you. We want to support you. And actually this um, a webinar will be also available as part of our resource list. So hopefully you can tune into all those great uh, available tools. Yeah. Uh, so thanks to everyone for joining us today. And we hope that you enjoyed the summit and will stay tuned to all of these wonderful uh, support services that we have to offer you. Take care, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.